I'm so thrilled to just take this moment to welcome us into this space. And thank you, Minot. And I am just so delighted to hear everything you're about to share. You've been doing so much good work at UVM, and I look so forward to hearing everything you're about to say. And please take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Petra. That was a really sweet introduction. Um, I'm, I have a presentation prepared for us, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, some, so bear with me um, <laughs> while I do this. Um, um, all right. Is that, is that visible to everyone? Yes, it looks great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as Petra mentioned, my name is Mignot. I'm a graduate student at the University of Vermont. Um, and for the past about a year and a half, we've been uh, working on some research around seed systems in the Northeast. And so today I'm going to be sharing um, some findings of a study we conducted around uh, resource access and barriers within the Northeast organic seed system and what kind of implications these findings may have towards building equity within um, this region and the seed system. So as most of you all can probably deeply attest to, there are a lot of reasons why a person is drawn to organic seed work, right? Um, these are just a handful that I've highlighted, but there are numerous, numerous personal, communal, and ecological benefits to um, engaging in organic seed work, right? Um, and the question that keeps popping up, um, especially in our research for the past year, is who um, gets to participate and who is excluded within these systems? Um, and when we talk about, you know, inclusion and exclusion, we're really talking about power, right? Who gets to connect to their heritage? Who gets to diversify food production and consumption? Who gets to develop regional economies? Who gets to support biodiversity and et cetera? And so this question um, is what motivated this study really, um, is trying to understand um, what are the, the experiences and relationships within the organic seed system in the Northeast that, um, that limit who can participate and reap the benefits of working with seed and building relationships with organic seed. Um, and just to highlight um, some, of the, some of the information that we've gathered that lets us know that there are these exclusionary tendencies, um, here are some quotes that I pulled from uh, respondents from a survey we conducted around um, the Northeast Organic Seed System, the same survey that informs this study that I'll talk about later. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of quotes that a respondents shared with us that I think paint a bit of a picture, right, of what people are going through and experiencing in the seed system that hinder um, their participation. Um, questions around disability and ability, um, racial homogeneity and whiteness within seed work, um, organic seed work specifically. Um, child care and caretaking responsibilities, right, and, and language and cultural barriers. Um, so I thought this might be helpful in sort of generating a picture of what's motivating us. And perhaps you might also relate as well um, if, you know, for those of you who are involved in the Northeast organic seed system. Um, and so organic seed systems, so are complex, dynamic, intricate, fascinating. Um, hard to sort of conceptualize at times. And so we found it helpful in doing this research to think about um, the formal organic seed sector and the informal organic seed sector. Um, and this was helpful for us when doing this research um, to understand, to add another dimension of positionality with um, the seed system, right? Because we've noticed in other bits of our research that participation in formal organic seed sector um, is different than participating in the informal organic seed sector. And that affects the landscape of resource access you have, the amount of power you might feel, et cetera. And so when throughout this presentation, if you hear me say the formal seed sector, I'm mainly referring to um, like seed companies, land grant universities, um, folks that are involved in like the private and public sector of society. 
Um, and then informal seed sector is, um, I'll be like referring to as like farmer, farmers, gardeners, seed libraries, community gardeners. Um, so just to clarify before I get into the nitty gritty of it all. Um, and of course, these two sectors aren't distinct. I also want to communicate that we do recognize that people are involved in both simultaneously move in and out. Um, and there is relationships and partnerships between the sector. There's conflict and tension between the sectors. And it really just depends, um, again, on who's involved. That goes back to the dynamicism and like how intricate and complicated and rich seed systems can be. Um, and so in talking specifically about the Northeast organic seed system, um, I thought I'd just share what exactly I'm talking about in terms of geographically. Um, so for the sake of our study, we sort of from Ontario, Pennsylvania, um, Maryland and Delaware, all the way eastward. So like New England, um, as well as the provinces of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia and Quebec were kind of our um, scope for um, the study, just to sort of make that clear. Um, and so, like I mentioned, the study was motivated by this question of participation and exclusion. And how does that affect um, the kind of, the flow of resources and the kind of barriers people experience? So our research objectives that we, um, you know, wrote down was one, um, determine how access to resources is distributed across diverse seed workers, um, assess how challenges um, to seed work are perceived across diverse seed workers, and also understand the degree to which seed workers experience power in their seed work, and whether these differences um, differ across identity and position, um, and can even be uh, attributed to identity and position. And so to fulfill these research objectives, we collected, we, we used data that we collected as part of this greater project. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm part of a team of researchers who you know, study um, seed systems in the Northeast. And in the past year, we've been working on a needs assessment, um, sort of starting with the 2021 Northeast Organic Seed Conference. Um, some of y'all maybe might remember people in the chat saying, hello, we're here taking notes. Um, during the conference, uh, so that was part of the needs assessment we conducted. Um, we also hosted a day of group sessions um, where folks could share with others and talk about their experiences in the system. Um, and we used these notes from the conference sessions and the group sessions to create a survey. And this survey is, the responses to the survey is what we're using to answer these research objectives, if that. It's clear. Um, I feel like it can be kind of confusing to outline out loud. Um, so yes, the needs assessment survey took place last summer. We sent it to all 387 registrants of the 2021 Northeast Organic Seed Conference um, with also some encouragement for folks to share it to people who didn't attend the conference, but are involved in organic seed work in the Northeast. Um, and that resulted in 118 total responses respondents. And so afterwards, we downloaded all the survey data into SPSS, which is a like statistical analysis software, just to get a feel for the data, see what's happening, understand um, the kind of responses we got. And we also use SPSS to conduct some tests, some statistical tests um, between respondents characteristics, right, their identities, the role they play in the seed system, um, to their resource access challenges and empowerments. And what I'm sharing in this presentation will be the findings from these tests. Um, but before getting into the findings, um, the meat, um, I wanted to share um, who exactly is represented in the survey responses, um, as well as sharing the kind of characteristics that we did test for. Um, so in terms of race, um, most of the survey respondents were white. Um, most of the survey respondents were women. Um, in terms of income, we found that close to 60% of respondents had a household income, a total household income of less than $50,000 in 2020. 
and we found the age of the average respondent was around 45 years old with close to eight years in seed work. Um, and so when we tested um, for resource access challenges and empowerment, we looked at race, gender, income, age, and years in seed work. We also um, test, tested um, the type of activities people are involved in in the seed system. Um, and like we mentioned, you know, folks, as you all very well know, are involved in different types of seed, stuff, seed, seed activities. No one's in one particular box. Um, so respondents were able to choose more than one response. Um, nonetheless, we found that we had a lot of representation from the informal seed sector that I described earlier, um, namely community-based and nonprofit seed work, which we defined as um, like folks involved with seed libraries, community gardens, uh, any type of nonprofit involved in facilitating connections and relationships around seeds, um, and then home-based seed work, so organic seed work at the household level. Um, so pretty solid representation from the informal seed sector here um, in the survey. So let's get into the findings. Um, so the first um, arena we tested was resource access. Um, on the survey, we had asked respondents um, how accessible they found these lists of resources to meet their needs. Um, and on a scale of one being very inaccessible and four being very accessible, we found that among respondents, funding to support non-commercial seed work, legal counsel and advice, and funding to support commercial seed work were the least accessible resources. Um, and then on the other hand, we found that information about growing seed crops as well as harvesting and processing seeds were the most accessible. Now to run these tests, we basically added up all of these items to create one variable that is represented overall resource access. So rather than testing for the specific resources, we just tested for overall resource access. And when we tested that across different characteristics, we found that age has a positive association to resource access, meaning younger respondents tend to have access to fewer resources. Um, alternatively, you could also look at it like older respondents tend to have access to greater resources. Um, years in seed work um, had a positive association, meaning that the more years in seed work respondents had, they tended to have greater access to resources. And we also found that amongst our respondents being um, involved in plant breeding research um, and scientific work um, meant that you're amongst our respondents meant that you are likely to have greater resource access than those who are not. And so secondly, we looked at challenges and barriers, right? Um, and similarly, we asked respondents how challenging the following list of obstacles were for them. Um, and on a scale from one being not challenging at all and four indicating significantly challenging, um, we found that amongst respondents, technology was the least challenging obstacle for them. Um, and then we found that financial capital um, was the most significantly challenging, which matches up to what we found with the resource access, right? Um, and so we added up all of these individual lineups um, or line items to create one overall um, variable representing uh, just challenges generally um, that respondents experience. And when we tested them against the characteristics, we found that community-based and nonprofit seed workers uh, were with, amongst our respondents were likely to experience more challenges than those who aren't involved in community-based nonprofit work. And then we found that um, those involved in seed companies within our respondents um, are likely to experience fewer challenges than those who are not involved in seed, in seed companies. And lastly, but certainly not the least, we looked at empowerment. Um, and there we go. Um, we asked respondents, you know, um, a, set, a series of agreement statements prefaced by I have the power to. So, for example, I have the power to influence policy regarding seed production, for example. And we asked them to rate how much they agree with the following statements to get a sense of the level of empowerment they feel. 
And so with one indicating strongly disagree and four indicating strongly agree, um, respondents felt least empowered to Im influence policy regarding seed production. Um, they felt most empowered, however, to make decisions about seeds that they grow in ways in, that are aligned with their values. So similarly, like we did with resource access and challenges, we created a, uh, a variable that just represented overall levels of empowerment across respondents. And we conducted the tests and we found that there was a positive association with income, meaning the higher respondents income, the more empowered they tend to feel. Um, with home-based seed workers, um, we found that our respondents were involved in home-based seed work were likely to feel less empowered than those who don't conduct their seed activities at the household level. Um, Community-based seed workers and nonprofit seed workers uh, are likely to feel more empowerment than those who aren't within our sample. Um, and then commercial seed producers um, who are likely to feel more empowered than those who aren't, at least within, again, our sample. Um, and just to sort of I feel like I, I gave a lot of information, so hopefully this chart will help um, simplify what I just explained. So um, just a review of findings. In terms of resources, um, age and years in seed work had a positive association, meaning the older uh, respondents were, the more um, access to resources they had. Um, and then the more years and experience respondents had, the more uh, resource access they had. And similarly for respondents who are involved in plant breeding or research, um, as well as being involved in extension work, um, tended to have more, or were likely to have more access to resources. And then with challenges, we found that those involved in community seed work were likely to have, um, were likely to experience uh, more challenges than those who weren't. And then those involved in seed companies were likely to experience fewer challenges. Um, and then with power, um, as I just mentioned, the higher respondents income was, the more empowered they tend to feel. Um, and community seed workers um, also experienced, uh, or we also found that amongst community seed workers, they were likely to experience more empowerment. Um, and the same with the seed producers, also likely to experience more empowerment. Um, and home-based seed, home -based seed workers, um more likely to experience less empowerment um, than those not involved in seed work and so um i'll let this stay a little bit in case you don't want to look at it a bit more um but yeah this is um hopefully a, a comprehensive finding review of the findings i just presented so that you can kind of see where numbers may match up or not um but I also, before getting into the implications of these findings for equity in the Northeast, I do want to be clear about some limitations to our study, um, namely that some limitations that prevent us from generalizing these findings across the whole system, um, namely that we have a small sample size for our tests and limited representation, especially around race and ethnicity. And this is one of the reasons why um, we, we guess that race and ethnicity did not emerge as a significant, um, as a statistically significant um, factor around resource access, challenges and empowerment, um, limited representation. Um, and so, but we know through other research that we do, as well as um, anecdotes that um, race and, and, and ethnicity is a very important dimension around resource access, challenges and empowerment. Um, so this this study is preliminary um nonetheless there are trends here that can point us to different arenas for um for addressing issues of equity within the northeast um so let's get into the implications for equity um in the northeast organic sea system um so the first one i want to raise attention to is that Given our findings, there seems to be limited resource channels in the informal seed sector to support community-based and nonprofit seed work um, and home-based seed work, et cetera. Um, 
if you notice there was um, more often than not there were groups within the formal seed sector that were associated with greater access to resources and fewer challenges um, and that kind of prompted us to to consider if there was a skewed landscape of resource flow and access between the formal and informal seed sectors um, and the kind of um, and the kind of resource channels that exist within informal seed sectors. And this is a particularly like pertinent area. I mean, I don't know if I have to really, um, exp I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, um, but you know, the informal seed sector contributes so much to the Northeast organic seed system, um, namely around, you know, biodiversity and, you know, generating energy and excitement around organic seed, um, especially for people who, don't have the academic or professional exposure to um, seeds or organic seeds specifically. Um, and so I think focusing on the kind of partnerships and collaborations and support um, and resources um, within the informal seed sector would be uh, a, a strong place to start in addressing issues around equity. Secondly, um, joining the Northeast organic seed system as a young person or a newcomer could be particularly challenging for those without the necessary resources. And this is hearkening back to the findings around um, age and resource access, as well as years in seed work and resource access. Um, this in, it kind of prompts uh, questions around the growth and future of organic seed activity within the Northeast. Um, especially, um, you know, I'd like to situate the, these trends in the broader agricultural context around succession planning and intergenerational transfers of wealth and inheritances that shape farmland access, for example, or other essential resources to agriculture. And so I think, um, you know, this relationship between age and resource access does kind of um, fit into this broader conversation um, and efforts happening around um, the different, um, around who gets to participate in, in agriculture just broadly and how um, those without the personal capital and the personal relationships to facilitate, um, you know, wealth and resources uh, into seed work um, may be uh, hindered or sort of left out and excluded. And so I think, again, in, in addressing equity, um, looking at the experiences of young people or newcomers specifically might be an arena um, to consider. And lastly, the last implication I um, just kind of want to raise attention to is it seems like from these findings that feeling empowered in agency in one's seed work involves other factors alongside resource access and challenges. Um, I think one finding that highlights this is that community-based and nonprofit seed workers felt more were more or likely to feel more empowered than those not involved in community and nonprofit-based work, and they also were likely to experience more challenges um, than others not involved in that line of work. And so, th those findings put together did kind of you know take me back, at least personally. I was like, well, what's happening here? Um, and I think one thing that, you know, in the case of community driven work, you could say is um, the social connections, right? The community, the being a part of a, um, a social fabric around organic seeds could certainly be a reason um, why people do feel a sense of agency or empowerment in their work um, when they're involved in community based groups. Um, and so I think that kind of prompts us to consider, okay, well, there's something going on here in terms of people's ability to feel autonomous and, and empowered in their work, as well as empowered in the system to change it and shift it and make an impact. Um, it, there is more complicated story at hand beyond simply accessing resource resources and navigating challenges. Um, and so I do just want to kind of make note that um, there are a lot of opportunities uh, for this research to move forward and grow in collaborations and grow in um, in partnerships and uh, namely uh, around 
generating similar research like this with uh, more robust sample size to count like neglected factors like race and ethnicity. Um, similar research in other geographic regions would be kind of cool. Um, and looking closely at you know the role of mentorships, intergenerational sharing, the types of relationships between older folks and younger folks, um, newcomers, more experienced seed workers. Um, that would be, I think, an interesting place to sort of um, look where support may be necessary or already exists, who knows? Um, and, you know, I think partnerships with seed workers in the informal seed sector to support resource access in any way that, you know, we researchers can, whether that's, um, you know, in any way that, you know, we can with our, with our access to institutional resources. Um, so yeah, that's really um, all I have to share. Um, thank you all for listening. Uh, I'm open to any questions or comments. Um, the co-author for this study, um, Daniel Tobin, um, should also be here. I haven't checked. So Dan, I don't know if you're here or not. Um, but if he is, both of us are open to answering any questions um, and comments. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to listen and attend. So much. Goodness. We knew it. Thank you so much. Um, Melanie shared a really wonderful comment, question, observation in the chat that I'd love to lift up that Daniel did respond to, but I think it's a really, I'd, be, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Melanie shared, I wonder if partnering, partnering with BIPOC growers in the Northeast, like True Love Seeds, the Ujama Collective, Soul Fire Farm, having their BIPOC growers take the survey what that might lead and also you know acknowledging that having some monetary incentives for completing participating would be so crucial and yeah, i'm sure you've thought of this a thousand thousand times but curious what sparks in your imagination of how we might move forward in that yeah, I mean, I certainly agree, Melanie. There are a lot of groups in the Northeast, especially, um, at least that I'm becoming more and more aware of, that have um, a social justice mission um, specifically evolve, revolving around um, BIPOC participation and empowerment and, um, and uh, restoring connection to land and, and agriculture and seeds that would definitely, I think, partnering with them to do more research um, and like, and incentivizing that with monetary compensation, of course, um, would really, really, I think, be beneficial. Um, Dan, I don't know if, I feel like, I think Dan is doing similar research or something similarly informed, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that kind of addresses um, the the lack of representation within our survey. Um, and, I, and I do kind of want to make a point as well that this is, um, white women who are well represented in the survey do tend to be well represented broadly in research around sustainable agriculture so it is a concern that i i really recommend anyone involved in research in this field um, around sustainable ag to really be cognizant of and make deliberate uh, more deliberate and intentional choices around recruitment and um, sample size building um, so i think like melanie's um, uh, suggestion like partnering with BIPOC growers, it would be um, a great way to, to rectify that. If I may, uh, just to add on, um, so I'm Daniel Tobin. I uh, have been um, working with Mino and others on, on some of this work um, and want to congratulate Mino for, for uh, her excellent work and, and a great presentation. Um, Melanie, yes, it, it's absolutely, it's a, it's a really good observation. Um, and something that we've been thinking about, we have um, we've been developing a partnership with Ujama uh, currently, and and have connections with um, True Love Seeds and so forth. The difficulty um, that we always find is is even though um, at working in a university, uh, resources are are as the as our data show are often easier to come by. We're also constrained by the ways that we can use our resources, and so unfortunately. Um, sometimes paying people incentives uh, for whatever reason there are rules that prevent us from doing so uh, but to your point um, we're looking for funding right now to ensure that um, we can uh, provide those kinds of incentives for people's time um, 
to uh, ensure that these perspectives are represented. And and I I, I suppose that just the uh, you know other comment I would make is is um, because we have found in in this scope of work that um, that representation among diverse groups is is not what it should be. We've carved out other smaller studies, and so for example, I've been working with um, refugee farmers and gardeners in Burlington in order to understand, um, you know, how they, how why seed is important to them and the way in which they utilize seed systems. Um, have other work with um, uh, Abenaki growers in Vermont, and so um, certainly is on our radar and are just confronting some of the institutional challenges in order to um, proceed in a way that we feel good about and, and would adhere to the kind of ethical commitments that that you raise that we also agree are really important. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I was just thinking too, as, as you talked about some of the complexities of, of funding and money and how the university system um, works is maybe thinking also about like, um, partnering with someone like, I don't know, like just throwing it out there like Johnny C's hypothetically and being like, hey, can we get, you know, 10, $25 gift cards to give to, you know, our BIPOC growers to, to participate in this. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there. I'm sure that, you know, y'all thought of things like this, but I'm, I'm just, you know, like there's so many unique ways to get around the bureaucracy of money sometimes. And I know sometimes it does take a little bit longer. And then I see Heron has their hand up and maybe they have a comment to add to that. So thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Mignot. Yeah, I think my, my comment isn't especially about the survey, but more of the context in which the survey was, was conducted is that it was linked to this Northeast Organic Seed Conference model. Um, so, the attend most of the people who responded were a subset of the attendees of this particular single conference and so a bunch of the funding that we were able to garner for that conference and the survey is research um, went to scholarships which were expressly um, conveyed to um, black indigenous and people of color um, through conduits like True Love Seeds and other folks that were working in those communities. So we actually asked folks who are working in those communities to basically distribute those and seek folks who would want to attend. Um, so it was rather than having people apply, um, it was basically like a network model. And so we had a lot of folks from Louisiana to Saskatchewan, all kinds of folks who attended quote outside our region um, into this conference. So. It, it is a sort of the question of whether this research in that model reflects race and ethnicity. It really at most reflects the race ethnicity, if at all, the segment of those that attended the conference. So it's it's sort of we're trying to use extrapolation, I guess. But again, as we know, it said it's not a good it's not a good extrapolation because it, that wasn't the focus of the of the study. Um, I had a, I had a question for Mino and maybe Dan. Um, is this difference in access to resources or um, between older and younger, let's say, in any other field? Let's say if let's say it's I don't know construction or carpentry or engineering or something. Is this or the number of years in certain work? Is this ratio different for seed work than any than like particular other interests or maybe other no, career is not the word, but I'm just wondering how does that, what we're seeing in this, maybe relate to other um, interests or activities? I'm not particularly sure and like familiar with uh, how other, I guess, fields may be a better way to, to describe it, how um, those generational gaps exist. I know with agriculture specifically, that is um, a topic of conversation. Uh, periodically, given that land is so hard to acquire and land is, seems pretty essential, right, to seed work and ag. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Dan, if you're familiar with other fields or sectors that have the similar kind of dearth in. in yeah, it's a good question, Heron, and I'm, I um, am reticent to uh, provide any kind of concrete answer because um, we, we haven't really scanned outside of uh, the agricultural sector in terms of how uh, how, how age affects access to resources and, and so, for example, the sectors that you mentioned. Um, 
my supposition would be um, any sector where there are high barriers to entry um, uh, would certainly provide barriers, you know, and, and I, and as you all well know, um, seeds, you know, both seed saving specifically and agriculture generally certainly is marked by that. So, um, but it, it's a certainly a thread that um, you raised that we should follow up on and, and kind of do a, a comparison across economic sectors to evaluate whether um, seed saving in agriculture is unique or whether it aligns with other kinds of labor activities. And I, and I want to just make clear, I wasn't asking that to say that if it turns out we're in less re ratio that we shouldn't make this a priority. I just wanted, I just wondered, like it is a huge priority, like youth access to resources and getting into work period, the seed work, agricultural in general, like we need to make that a huge focus in the Northeast. Just, I was just more curious, like, are we way outside the mean in our societal kind of like uh, structure or, or are we in within the same kind of same oppressive model? Are we doing any better or are we doing the same? Thank you. Oh, Solve, I can't wait. I mean, don't get your hopes too high, but um, I, <laughs> I thought, um, the um the coexistence of uh more access to resources within the formal seed sector versus the informal seed sector like that's that's not super surprising but um i think it's a great opportunity for people within i guess i'm coming from more a perspective of within like the public plant breeding sector or university-based plant breeding sector now and i have a um colleague here on the call we've been uh, thinking a lot about ways to um, increase equity in terms of who's in the room and who can make decisions and who has access to resources within public plant breeding and like um, that connection I think could be really fruitful for both sides um, sides um, especially as like several conversations during this conference have centered around how um, the quantitative data collected by say variety trials like I work in really need to be complemented with other ways of knowing and perceiving about seeds. And like, like people are hungry, like even we researchers <laughs> who like to crunch numbers are hungry for more qualitative um, uh, input about like, what we're doing with these seeds what what is it like to raise these and how do they impact our lives so um yeah i see a lot of like mutual benefit to be had by increasing interaction in a way that gives actual power to in the informal seed sector um and doesn't just you know make them do the things universities want them to do um right so that's <laughs> Any comments on that is great. Uh, just some thoughts running around. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd be happy to um, likewise uh, to spitball a little bit. Um, you, I, you know, I think that it, it, increasingly what I've been seeing, at least in the global, global north, is more attention being paid to the role of uh public universities um and kind of the checkered history that they've had in terms of exacerbating um and perpetuating inequalities there was um, a really interesting paper actually coming out from a group of sociologists in canada hannah whitman and um harriet friedman who, who basically yeah. named this right and it's and kind of like um you know we, we if we're going to call ourselves public universities we need to be pursuing research for the public good as opposed to uh, research that um, continues to reproduce the, the rich resources of universities at the exclusion of, of others, and often with, with private money flowing in, and, and then research that's reflective of the private sector, um, which is certainly why, you know, as a sociologist, and, and Minyot as well, is, is, um, we're always keen to, to partner and collaborate with plant breeders and, and those who are, operate more in the biological sciences, because we're interested in the very questions that you're you're talking about in terms of what does it mean you know we 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 it is one thing to understand um scientific processes of of breeding in, in terms of what is possible 
but it's a whole different set of questions of when this is actually disseminated into society and what kinds of power structures and social identities mediate who gets access um, to resources and, and what are the how the innovations that are coming off of um, research stations at universities actually match the priorities and perspectives of, of you know the, the the folks who are actually doing the good work um so I, you know i don't know if we res have resolved it certainly um lessons in the global south i think are quite um insightful uh things around participatory plant breeding and participatory varietal selection which i know there's um, been some emphasis at the conference on this as well and and i think is um you know uh the profile of those kinds of activities are being raised but I, I'm in total agreement, right? We need to do better and we need to be um, pursuing um, interprofessional, interdisciplinary work to, to both understand um, scientifically what's possible, but also sociologically and anthropologically what, what, is, what are the implications of this work. Absolutely. I'm at UBC right now working with Hannah and I would love to collaborate with you all if you want to, you know, regarding distributing a similar survey up here, et cetera. Oh, we should connect. I just, you know, I don't want to take up all the time and just want to also say, please, anyone else chime in. Um, there's some great conversation happening in the chat right now about a collaborative um, kind of needs assessment. Um, and I just wanted to say that OSA has done needs assessments and also just like surveys for seed growers. And um, they have been some i would say like a little insular just because like we, we we work with a network of people sometimes and uh we are reaching out and branching out to work with more diverse growers and people who are not already in the network and so we've done some surveys as well um to reach out specific, uh, specific, specifically to bipoc growers um and see what their needs are here in the pacific northwest and so anyways i was just mentioning that it would be nice if we could like streamline needs assessments and maybe like as the Northeast is doing a survey, the Pacific Northwest is doing a survey, the Central Mountain Time and, you know, um, the South and so forth, they also offer some type of survey that might have cohesive questions. So that way, when we take that data and compound that data and say like, oh, here, the Northeast, this is really this is what we're seeing. And in the Pacific Northwest, this is what we're seeing because we do have different demographics. You know, like if you go down to the South, which has a larger population of people of color, black, black and brown people, um, you know, they're they might you might see different information. And so, anyways, it's just kind of a thought that popped in my head as we were chatting here um, and how we can create some kind of like um synergy um in, in these different surveys. And maybe and maybe that would allow for collaborative funding as well so like as we talk about how we can compensate people for their time that might be like a really great project where we could say let's apply to some i don't know usda grant somewhere and uh you know um ask for funding and be able to compensate our growers you know you know x amount of dollars um for their time Yeah, that's a really great idea, Melanie. I think also, um, given how agriculture varies by region, kind of drastically um, around questions of like farmland access and labor and processing and all these kind of questions um, that are pretty um, also very integral to seed systems. So I think that would be really interesting. I, I'd be really interested in that. my human connection starved brain is saying oh my goodness yes and let's combine this with in-person gatherings when we can so there's this like center of like how do we connect as humans and then this survey is an extension of that community and especially if those can all happen you know in relative time proximity to each other so there's this larger sense of 
um, being together in a wider community, even as we're gathering in these more regional communities. So then we're, you know, creating like bona fide layers of like, I'm imagining it as fascia, like muscles within these communities as a wider, in our wider communities. And this survey is then just, you know, this fruit that emerges from this already living, breathing being that exists um, and can always be more connected. She said dreaming. A marvelous question from Tierra in the chat. To Mignot and Daniel, what would be the dream next steps for this research? I love the idea of combining research from other regions, connecting with more BIPOC seed folks, but are there other topics within research you want to dive into or perhaps need more attention? Well, this is where it gets kind of interesting. There are things that I personally am very fascinated by and interested in looking into, um, specifically around um, this question of intergenerational um, resource access and sharing is something that has popped up during the study that I find interesting. Um, but I think in terms of um, in terms of this study and the kind of needs assessment we've been doing recently. Um, you know, this is all like the first steps to really sort of, or there's a lot of iterations of this kind of research that can kind of take place over time, um, especially around networks and connections and how are people um, in community are in contact with each other and how does that shape uh, resource, resources and power dynamics and all those elements of seed systems. So I think that's certainly an area that could, um, Kind of get at the root of of what um, different dimensions of seed work could um, stem from. Yeah, and if I may add on um, uh, to to Minyot's answer, um, just a couple of thoughts. One, you know, um, our intention in conducting the research is is uh, not our making decisions about what to do with the research, but but hopefully providing information for those who are actually engaged and, and structure the seed systems to make informed decisions, right? We, we, don't, um, we don't see it as our role uh, to uh, dictate uh, how to use this information. We just are hoping to be useful um, as different stakeholders across geographic contexts or, or with our, within our region think about next steps. Um, and so that's, you know, that's really the trajectory. We'll have a set of conversations with Heron and and others coming up um, in terms of the research and some of the reports that we're writing in terms of how do we get this out and, and maximize its impact or at least its, its distribution so that people are able to utilize it as a tool moving forward. Um, from a research perspective, I, I think that there are a couple of things, kind of big issues that we are looking at um, to further understand. One of them um, is around issues of governance. You know, who gets to decide how seeds are used, who has ownership, what are norms around um, sharing, um, how do we give credit, is, is uh, viewing seeds as a common resource desirable, um, are, are kind of really um, uh, difficult but really important topics, I think, as we, as we consider um, seed systems that are uh, more inclusive and diverse than earnest. Um, and the other area that that is related um but but uh, you know can can provide um some traction for further research is is around potentials to to actually link informal and formal seed systems in mutually beneficial ways um i, I think it's um, pretty clear historically that uh formal seed systems have been favored in terms of policy at the exclusion of, of informal seed systems and so if we are able to highlight the importance of informal seed systems to things like 
um, di genetic diversity within regions, um, uh, access to culturally meaningful crops that we, we hope that uh, we can think about mechanisms and, and institutional uh, norms and rules that will actually foster mutual benefits as opposed to uh, privileging formal seed systems over over informal seed systems. But again, that you know, we are we view our um, role as documenting uh, information and and then um, trying to facilitate its distribute its distribution into the hands of, of people who are actually doing the work so they can self determine how to proceed um, without the influence of, of again, institutions that have not uh, always been uh, good allies in the pursuit of, of things like equity and diversity. Thank you for that, Daniel. Um, just, just to keep the conversation going, and I invite everyone to please unmute, chime in, questions, comments, anything. Um, but I, I just wanted to add to that, Daniel, um, you know, some and um, Mignette, some of the things that we found in some of our BIPOC surveys that we've done um, is that it, specifically in the BIPOC community, they're not looking to monetize seed or seed production. You know, they look at this as something that is a shared community resource. And there, and so sometimes uh, to your point of like, you know, coming into these these systems that have been in place for years, it's more of like, we don't want to participate in that because this is not the path that we're looking to go on. And so understanding that and saying and, and trying to create inclusive ways of how they can still be included into these systems or create a new system. Um, so there's this, there is a huge um, disconnect sometimes in what some of these you know uh, universities and research and um, institutions have been doing for years that that uh, BIPOC community members are just not interested in being a part of they're looking to preserve seeds to share them with community members preserve their cultural heritage seeds a lot of times we have um, a huge like African community here and they came to me and they were like we want corn from our country it's not the same corn as here and it was just something that like at that time of like my entry into seed, I had never thought about that before. And so then the next question was, well, how do we get corn from our homeland to here? And so, you know, trying to teach people about like, like, um, like GRIN and other USDA pro, uh, uh, or U the USDA GRIN system that helps you get seeds from international, like from uh, over in other countries, but it's such a complicated system and like can we have a class to teach people how to navigate that what are you looking for what are some key words and so forth so anyways i just wanted to offer that and say that's some of the stuff that i've, I've seen and um, i'm gonna start calling on people <laughs> like um let's see who's who's in the room here um tara <laughs> any thoughts anything coming up for you Lindsay, Natasha, hello. We would love to hear your voices in this conversation. Emily. I can chime in a little bit. This is Lindsay. I am um, a plant breeder at Johnny Selected Seeds. And so that's been kind of a lens I've been thinking about this conversation through. Um, and I like the idea, you know, ask us to give you some gift cards. <laughs> I know um, I know our charitable giving committee is working on doing more proactive giving with, I'm not sure of the exact focus is, I read the PDF the other day, but one of them is land access, which I was really excited to hear um, versus just waiting to get requests for donations and then give out, you know, gift baskets, but more proactive giving and increasing that budget, so um that's something that i'm i'm happy about and i think you know don't be shy to ask because that is something that our company is our senior leadership is putting a priority on recently which i'm i'm happy about hey melanie i just wanted to uh, chime in that um there's uh new american farmers in maine that um have brought and are 
growing seed and corn of corn they brought from, and I'm not exactly sure which countries or which cultures, but I think sometimes what's happening is, is like, we're not all aware of what each other is doing from different places. So maybe someone has a challenge they're trying to solve and maybe someone else, some other community has solved that or is in the process of solving that. So um, that's also part of that. Um, how do we know what each other's doing? That's such a great point. Thank you. Yeah, it sometimes feels like we're operating in silos and, you know, maybe we don't have to always reinvent the wheel because someone has already done it. Thank you. Sylvain. Okay. Um, I have two thoughts. Um, one is I totally agree that like helping people understand the value of informal seed systems is key to helping drive resources that way. And it strikes me that it's it's part persuasion with like, you know, data about agrobiodiversity and um, access to culturally meaningful crops and stuff like that. But it's it's also part inspiration by like inviting people into like the just the, the beauty around seeds and the magic that is like here in this community in the organics or that I found in the organic seed community that I hadn't found before that. Um, so just the role of artists and um, and like the artists in all of us and doing that um, and stories and all that stuff. Um, then I had another thought, like I, I'm seeing the chat go by about like renaming the Northeast Organic Seed Conference to Northeast Community Seed Conference. And I guess, it, I guess as a question, because I'm not in this region and it's not up to me what anybody does, but like, I sense that there's a want, there's like a need to make that change or a desire to make that change because of the exclusionary aspects of, of the word organic itself or the, maybe the organic marketing um, commercialization system that does have exclusionary aspects for sure. Um, I, I wonder about your perspectives on exclusionary aspects of the word community, if we mean it to be only one kind of seed system, if we only mean that to apply to the informal seed system, because like there's been a lot of talk at this conference about how these informal and formal seed systems overlap and interact and inform one another and like, um i would it would make me sad to see community be a term around which exclusion happens you know um that's what i got yeah i think that's a valid point i also would say that the way we've been organizing the conference has been a really volunteer community model albeit like lacking full you know representation but hopefully that circle expands rather than contracts that's the goal is like every iteration is more folks and it seems like that is working um i think the community question is like we need people to be working with seed and we don't want them to feel like they have to be explicitly certified organic or even like understand what that word means in the white context of that to be involved in seed and also like, what are we trying to build? Like without community to me, organic is meaningless. Do you know what I mean? Like to me, it's more important to build, to, whether it's organic seed growers who are talking to each other or seed savers that are talking to each other or talking to all of these groups talking because they overlap with each other. I see seed companies as part of our community. You know, like what is the definition of community is really in a person's mind. And yes, it could be exclusionary at any point. It already is exclusionary. So like organic is already exclusionary. It's an exclusive branding model. So like, because the USDA is using, you know, we've, we've come to this point where organic is an exclusive brand. And I, it's, you know, the question is like, are we trying to welcome people into the ex exclusive organic seed model? Or are we trying to welcome people into a community of people in the region working with seed. Um, and I think that that, like, of course, there's no perfect word, but we've definitely, as a whole community, not just from 
black and indigenous people of color communities, but like even within the white seed saving community, feeling like the word organic is like kind of like, do I belong here? Is a, this is also onerous in that world? So, um, you know, the word organic, we have to do work in this sphere. Um, and I, I feel like more of what this work of mentorship and meeting young people in a space where they can work together is really like, um, you know, I, I want to hand these words off to the next group of people to decide this, the name of this could change every two years. I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, that's the part of it. Like, let's not make things a monolith. I think that we get ourselves into a trouble when we say like, this is the word. Well, we could change that word next time. It could be the Northeast uh, exclusive seed conference. <laughs> You know, it, it reminds it reminds me of how um, Amira was very well spoken at the end of the seed naming um, session when she said um, we're asking a name to do a lot in terms of conveying like the fullness of any any seed story, and I I think we're getting into the same territory. Like there there is no perfect name, and words are interpreted differently by different people, and so yeah. Um, I appreciate the conversation. Yeah. You know, I just, I want to just add to that really quickly. And I see that there's some other comments coming up in the chat, you know, as part of the organic seed Alliance, we go through that same question very, very often. Um, and just thinking about how exclusive the organic certification process is, especially to any BIPOC members, um uh, of in any region for that matter um so it, it, there is a lot of barriers however you know another reason why we use the word organic is because there is this distinct there's this distinction between organic seed or open pollinated seed as well as you know um patented seed and and seeds that are not um you know seeds that we can't you know, use or save seed from and things like that. And so there was this need to distinguish ourselves from these other, you know, uh, patented seed companies and GMOs and all that jazz and things like that. And that was one important. And also, a lot of people don't know the foundation of where organic came from and what some of the key principles to organic means. So certification aside, let's just put the certification aside and let's focus on what organic means, which means being a steward of the soil, uh, you know, water preservation. And there's all these different principles that came, that were the foundation of organic. And that is why Organic Seed Alliance keeps that name organic is because it's based off of these principles of, of soil stewardship and nurturing and, um, you know, regenerative um, and, and all these different components that come along with it. Um, so I think that if we start talking about organic as not the certification, but more of the principles that come along with the stewardship of being a, an organic or or sustainable or regenerative farmer, I think that's where we can start hopefully making people feel more included into this movement. Um, so I just wanted to offer that. And then I wanted to say, Donna, I see that you put some things in the chat. Did you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? There, yeah. am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. My personal belief that is that organics is not something that you tithe for. It's a practice. It's a practice that you, in an interaction with the land and the seeds and the plants and the sun, you know, the whole biosphere. And to have to tithe in order to be called organics is just wrong it it is exclusionary in itself because all of a sudden you're it's monetary and you know I, it's a word that you should be able to use just because you're practicing the practice that's it and mentorships that's my other one we need teachers teachers are important if people because when i was growing seed i was just like thrown out there and said well you do this this and this just a minute just a minute no don't need anything else you do this this and this but 
no one elaborated, no one shown me. I was like groping in the dark and I had to teach myself how to do everything. Can I have my back? I won't eat any chocolate. You won't eat any chocolate. Go on. No chocolate. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> No, it's no chocolate. We won't eat any chocolate either, okay? It's not no chocolate, it's no more chocolate. No more <laughs> chocolate. He's <laughs> had enough. <laughs> he's and only four, he's eaten enough for a 12 year old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yep. All right, so we, we still have a few folks in the audience we haven't heard from. We'd love to hear from you. Riley, Angela, Hank, Natasha. If any of you feel um, inclined to unmute, add any, anything that's coming up for you throughout this conversation, we would love to hear from you. Go ahead, Angela, you're unmuted. Hi, Melanie. Hi, everyone. I have really enjoyed your presentation and this discussion. I'm in La Conner, Washington. I'm a new board member, so I'm mostly just listening in and learning, but uh, I've also been an academic and I just want to say it's great to see this collaborative effort and seeking data and presenting it in a way that uh, can be applied and used by those who are out actually doing the work. Um, so I applaud all of your work and thank you for letting me join in. Um, Manil, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? How can folks support your work um, or um, get involved? How can we share this information, this wonderful information that you share with us? What What do you think is the next steps in this in this um, this this data that you collected? Yeah. Um, so, if you all remember from the presentation, um, the data that we use to in informed the research study is um, one of is part of a larger needs assessment that we are generating um, that involves qualitative data so notes um, and worksheets and exercises that people um, conducted in groups group sessions and um, the needs I've been writing up a summary report of the assessment for the past couple of months we're getting close to the final stages of releasing it publicly we're still in the works I'm trying to discuss how um that will be released but um that is a document that i hope will also serve um serve folks in the northeast to get a, a better understanding of what happened uh, the kind of relationships and dynamics that occurred at the seed conference and how that ties into trends um uh, outside of the conference with the survey data so um keep an ear, keep an eye out and ear out um uh, within the next you know few months hopefully uh, we'll be able to find a way to, to share it um, and disseminate it in a way that's um, thoughtful and expansive so that um, pe as many people as possible can read it. Um, maybe you see themselves reflected in the assessment or not, right? And I think that's the, I think the fun part of releasing um, reports, summary reports like this is seeing where there's tension and seeing where there's um, opportunities to change and shift and respond. Uh, to people's needs um because like dan says you know we we are trying to operate in relationship and in response to people's needs um and seeing um how we can support that and and use that to motivate uh, our work as well so yeah needs assessment stem report coming to someplace near you soon <laughs> It would be okay to just extend what Minyo is saying is um, just to say that uh, we don't view this as a one off, right? The, the idea of this was is um, baseline data for the Northeast. Um, we're keen to collaborate uh, across regions, across sectors. Um, I, being at a university, uh, obviously, uh, not exclusively, can, but can put us in positions to access funding um, that others are, are not able to. and, and to the degree that we can 
be conduits of funding to get um, dollars out into the hands of people who are actually doing the work. We're um, that's what we're working on. That Heron had had asked um, if we could share a little bit about the collaboration that, that we have been uh, working on with Ujama. You know, and 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 um, it's exactly that, right? We're trying to respond to um, re respond to, to articulated um, priorities that uh, folks from Ujama have have articulated to us, right? And so, if we can be responsive to supporting the good work that is um, going on um, and and uh, identify and, and access funding um, to to foster the, that work, um, that's that's what we're here to do. So we don't see this as, you know, we wrote, we, we do a presentation and write a summary report and you'll never hear from us again. You know, we're just, I think, um, scratching the surface of, of the, the different kinds of questions and dimensions and information that could be useful. So um, I, I suppose that that's just a plug to say, please be in touch if, if it's at all of interest. Um, the, the conversation has been fantastic. And um, this in part is why we do the work because it gets us out of our uh, academic silos and, and provides opportunity to learn from people who are um, the actual experts of um, seeds and seed systems. So we just very much appreciate it. Mignot, thanks again for all of your care and curiosity. Thank you for sharing with us all today. And I can't wait to continue this conversation Ooh. in so many ways.